Hello, everybody, and uh, I hope you're all enjoying the various sessions that um, we're having here at the World Investment Forum. I'm Yvonne Okwara. I'm the moderator for this particular session, and we want to talk about um, sustainable internationalization of SMEs. Um, and when we talk about that, it's about uh, broadening um, you know, the work of various SMEs beyond their borders. And we'd like to hopefully move the conversation beyond one of import-export but to also see about um, you know, FDIs and getting more investments in the sector. Um, but most importantly as well, leveraging the development impact um, of this process. It is the goal and dream of every SME to move beyond its borders, but how do we do that? We'll be taking a look at some of the success factors of FDIs by SMEs. We'll be looking at the successes and the challenges so far, learning from each other, different countries and different um, regions. And um, we'll also talk about the challenges that have been brought on by the pandemic. Are some of them new and unique, or are they just old problems that have been brought to the fore by the pandemic? We'll also be taking a look at the strategies of investing in developing countries, what are their policies, um, and what can host countries do to incentivize investment um, in the SME sectors in their respective countries. So I'm looking forward to this great conversation. We are live around the world, and hopefully there will be some questions or comments as well from our viewers who are uh, logged on to this particular session. And uh, we'll get into that in a moment. We'll be focusing on different regions. Like I said, we'll be hearing from Africa, from India, uh, from Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, so please do stay with us throughout. I, um, I am so excited for you to hear from our panelists in just a moment, but first, um, this is a session that's been uh, put together, uh, of course, by UNCTAD in collaboration with the World Union of SMEs. And so we uh, thank you both for, for um, enabling this session to be possible. And so speaking of which, let's have now the opening remarks from Ms. Isabel Durand. She's the Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD. Ms. Durand. Thank you, Yvonne. And good afternoon, uh, all of you, or good morning for wh wherever you are in the world. So first of all, I would like really to welcome you warmly in this high level session on the sustainable internationalization of small and medium sized enterprises. It's obvious for all of us, but it's good to remind that SMEs are the backbone of economies in both developed and developing economies. SMEs constitute about 90% of all businesses, 60 to 70% of employment, and 50% of the GDP. In low-income countries, SMEs' contribution to employment is even higher, between 80 and 90%. Typically, there is a positive relationship between enterprise size and export participation meaning that larger firms are involved in international trade to a greater extent than smaller firms. But the internationalization of SMEs is also important as it comes with opportunities. It contributes to enhancing productivity, higher export earnings and economic growth, and in turn to development aspiration. We have examined various forms of internationalization of SMEs, notably also foreign direct investment. FDI by SMEs makes up only about 10% of global flows. Yet international investment activities by SMEs can have important development effects and can positively contribute to job creation and wage improvements, technology and cultural transfer, and supply chain upgrading. UNCTAD first published a study on FDI by SMEs three decades ago, but much has changed since then. We have seen a new industrial revolution, the rise of emerging players and countries, and of course, the growing importance of global value chains. And in addition, the COVID-19 and climate crisis have further changed the landscape. So we just need to improve our understanding of FDI by and in SMEs. Let me outline of the main trends. First, digitalization. Digitalization is driving rapid change on an unprecedented global scale and brings many opportunities for SMEs. 
Digital technologies enhance productivity, offer opportunities for scaling up and enable SMEs to be or become global players, a phenomenon of small firms born global. Second, increasing importance of regional value chains. Technology trends decline in cross-border FDI over the last decade. More protectionist international policies and the COVID crisis have led to a transformation of international production networks that favors shorter and more regional value chains. This transformation can possibly open up room for SMEs to be more competitive and pivotal in the development process of many emerging economies. Third, a shrinking pool of manufacturing investment projects. The decline of efficiency seeking FDI implies a reduction of manufacturing projects from large multinational enterprises. For host countries seeking to attract FDI, the implication is that they need to shift their focus toward smaller investors, developing a more structured portfolio, including investment attraction and facilitation programs. And fourth, COVID-19 hit SMEs particularly hard. In addition to the challenges they face uh, as small scale operators, the crisis further constrained their liquidity. So I hope that the discussion today and in the other segments of the forum will help answer the following important questions on FDI and SMEs. What drives FDI by SMEs and how does it differ from large multinational enterprises? What are the main challenges that SME investors face during the pandemic? What can FDI by SMEs contribute to the development and international competitiveness of home and host countries? The discussion in this panel and in the panel that follows will lay the ground for our new research project on SMEs and FDI. The aim of UMTAD's uh, new work in this area is really to improve our understanding of SME's role in the global economy, but in particular in developing economies and their contribution to development with a view to strengthening policies and programs to enhance that potential. So ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, excellencies, at the time when the global economy is still underperforming, we need to support and enable SMEs to innovate and scale up. This will boost aggregate productivity and foster more inclusive and sustainable growth. Before finishing, I would like to express my special gratitude to Mr. Terenzi, President of the World Union of Small and Medium Enterprises for the valuable collaboration in organization this session. I wish you, I wish us a fruitful discussion and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Durant, and for setting the stage for um, the conversations we are set to have um, and for getting us thinking already with the questions um, that we will encounter. And you also mentioned, you know, the academic session that will come after this one, but just to everybody, we will um, try and get an understanding of the knowledge that we have, um, you know, regarding this sector in just a moment. But uh, first, um, I would say, our co-host for this session, Ms. Barbara Terenzi, who is the president of the World Union of Small and Medium Enterprises. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen. WUSME, the World Union of Small and Medium Enterprises, is a SME's organization founded in the Republic of San Marino in year 2010. WUSME is in special consultancy status with UN ECOSOC since 2013 and with UNIDO since 2020, safeguarding the interest, right, and competitiveness of SMEs and craft worldwide. Presently, WUSME has 
representatives in more than 100 countries in five continents. As we know, SMEs are an important part of the economy in every country of the world. In particular, we must also consider women enterprises and young enterprises. Thanks to the support of its network and exchange between the countries, WUSME is voice of for SMEs to institutions worldwide to share views helping SMEs in making those hailing in the different countries promoting best practice. In over 10 years of, for, of activity, WUSME made many fact-finding mission and participated in global SMEs conferences, remarking that technology transfer from Europe and other countries is of mutual interest. In many discussion, with a large number of SMEs, WUSME has found that access to credit and other forms of financing are the greatest obstacle to their development on international markets, especially in developing countries. To manage this transformation, better access to finance especially reducing bureaucracy is essential. After the effect of COVID-19, today SMEs are also facing the impact of climate change on their activities. This change must not only be considered as trouble and cost, but also as new business opportunities in different countries. We are extremely grateful to Antact for having given us the opportunity to present ourselves and to collaborate in the realization of this forum. It will be an honor in the future as well to become your partner and to count on your advice in the interest of SMEs. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Ms. Terenzi, and uh, we really appreciate um, the work that you're doing, and indeed uh, for co-facilitating this uh, process and this particular session, and both of you, of course, um, emphasizing the importance of SMEs um, the fact that they've been uh, hardest hit by the pandemic, but looking towards solutions. And uh, like Mr. Renzi, you said, um, looking for the opportunity even um, in the crisis and the challenges that, that we face uh, at the moment. Um, but, you know, when it comes to um, understanding the knowledge, um, you know, around um, this uh, important subject at the moment, what do we know about the internationalization of SMEs? And more importantly, why is that process important for a sustainable economy? Um, let's understand now what we know, what we don't know, where the main gaps um, and why this is uh, particularly important. Uh, our keynote speech uh, now, uh, Dr. Peter Buckley, who is a professor of international business at the University of Leeds. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one reason why we might think that uh, SMEs are terribly important is that they, in the longer run, become large firms. And that's only true for a, a small number of them. But nevertheless, that is the first reason for seeking their importance. Rather more uh, uh, relevant for most economies is that, as we've already heard, SMEs are the absolute backbone of the economy. Uh, the OECD figure is 45% of employment in SMEs. But when we look at countries like Nigeria, 96% of businesses in Nigeria are SMEs, accounting for 84% of employment and 48% of, of GDP. 
And this is this this these kind of figures are replicated across larger uh, developing and emerging economies. Uh, th the other factor I think that is important is the kind of ladder of development. If you look at a country like Jamaica, there are 100,000 registered SMEs in Jamaica, but there are actually 300,000 companies, small companies, because we also have to think about the informal sector. So one important uh, set of policies is to get the informal sector to become more formal to enable policies to interact with them. One of the other really fascinating things is the role of SMEs in knowledge development. China, which has 38 million SMEs and adds 5 million every year. One of the most interesting facts about, about Chinese SMEs is they account for 70% of Chinese patents. So they are knowledge creators as well as employment generators and uh, contributors to GDP. So it's, it's very difficult to, to overestimate how important SMEs are in terms of employment. 63 million of these in India, for instance, with 110 million employees. You, this is really important. And when we look at particular sectors, and I'm thinking of agriculture, and I'm thinking of services, this is even more important. So there are many reasons why SMEs are to be cherished, why the policy that, that, that help them and aid them, and as we just heard, do not hinder them, are, are extremely important because one of the words that I often use about SMEs is they are vulnerable. They're vulnerable to predatory behavior by large firms. They're vulnerable to te technological change and so on. So we have to be very, um, we have to cherish small firms and we have to make sure that their entrepreneurial skills are developed. So that's the sort of first part of the answer that, that SMEs are extremely important in upgrading economies. That's irrespective of their internationalization. They are really very, very important. It's impossible to have a proper development strategy without considering SMEs. Why is their internationalization important then? Their internationalization is important because going international allows a firm, a small firm, a large firm, any firm to access foreign resources. And key things that, that, that both small and large firms access are, first of all, foreign markets, foreign consumers. Secondly, foreign resources and inputs. Thirdly, they can make efficiency seeking investments. They can go to a country where some of their activities can be performed more efficiently. And size is not a barrier. We have to get away from the idea that size is the crucial thing. Inexperience and lack of knowledge is far more important than size. I have known of a company for a long, long time that has eight employees in, in the UK and a subsidiary in India. So size is not the key factor. The key factor is the management skills, is the experience, and is the information. And that gives us some idea as to how we can foster the growth of SMEs. We can help them to learn because learning and internationalization go together. Some people say internationalization comes before learning. Some people say learning comes before internationalization, but surely the two go together. So SMEs in internationalizing can learn about technology, they can learn about skills, they can learn marketing skills, they can access management skills. So all of those things are important for uh, SMEs. And digitalization has actually helped many SMEs to access those things. Now, the final issue about what we know and what we don't know and the structural issues, I think the key thing here, and I think it's very important to emphasize this, is the role of SMEs in global value chains. Because one of the ways that SMEs most effectively 
internationalize is by utilizing global value chains, either as a supplier or, or doing production or doing technology or doing specialist services for a value chain, for an existing global value chain and learning from this. And we know about the regionalization effect that the that, that SMEs build this regionally. And so plugging into global value chains is extremely important. The next stage is the most difficult one. That is moving from being part of a value chain to actually controlling and being the focal firm in a value chain. And that is the part I think that is the most difficult issue facing us. The one I think we should focus on and the one where we should ask, what are the barriers to SMEs from emerging countries leading value chains rather than being subservient members of value chains? In other words, not doing just the fabrication part, but doing the technology part, the management part, the marketing part, and so on. So we know that large emerging economies who have probably should be regarded as emerged, that's China and India can do this. Smaller countries, we really need to focus on how we need to do this. And we need to look at the threats and the opportunities to SMEs. But I think crucially, we cannot ignore the role of global value chains. And I hope we'll spend a little bit of time discussing that. There's so much to say about small firms. I think my time is probably up. Yvonne's come on to smile at me, to tell me to give up, to stop. So thank you very much. And I look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you, Peter. Um, so well put. And I'm not uh, chasing you by any means. Um, I just have one question for you because we've talked about what we do know. We've talked about the knowledge gaps. What more research do you think um, would be helpful as we move the conversation forward to address some of the issues that you have said uh, need some thinking through? I, I think I think the area I, I I can only speak for what I I would do because I think I think it, telling other people what to do is not sometimes not as effective as saying what I would do myself. And the area that I'm working on and the area that particularly concerns me is what are the skills, resources, knowledge, and information that small firms need to, to upgrade. Now, UNCTAD did a study of this in the uh, textile industry uh, a number of years ago. And they, they found that there were 30 different processes that an SME had to go through in order to upgrade its value chain from being simply a, a, a fabricator to being leading, branding, all these things. Now, times have changed since that report was written. Digitalization's come along, the pandemic and other threats have come along. So I think we need to revisit that, but we need to ask the question, what are the crucial barriers that, 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 that stop uh, at promising SMEs with a lot of entrepreneurial skills from developing their own internationalization path rather than kind of piggybacking on the internationalization path of established multinationals. And there's a lot of work going on in the international business area on this, but what we need to do is make it very concrete because this is gonna be different in different sectors, in different, in different host countries and different source countries. So those are the crucial things. It's really quite a micro type of approach I think we need and related to that and absolutely crucially for this set of panels what are the policies that enable that and indeed what are the policies that are preventing that can we remove the impediments and can we increase the incentives for SMEs to become really driving their own internationalization rather than piggybacking on foreign multinationals and other multinationals. Now, that, that's not to say that that other route of, of plugging into value chains is important. It will be important. It continues to be important. It's massively important. But in the long run, SMEs from emerging countries need to build their own value chains. And that is that, I, that to me, 
is, is what will make the difference between the internationalization from emerging countries. Indeed, thank you very much for that. Um, and, and, and that's really important. So it's not just um, getting onto those value chains, but it's then now taking control and being the focal point. Um, that is super interesting to hear. Let's now, um, you know, get uh, case studies and understanding of how this is happening in the specific regions. My first panel um, today is um, taking a look at the cases of Africa and Asia. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, my panelists for this next session are Mr. Dogad Dugui, who is a special representative of the World Union of SMEs. Um, and then we've also got uh, Sushma Mortania. Sushma Mortania is the founder director general at the India SME Forum. And we will also be hearing of um, what is the situation in Cambodia uh, from the director of SME department, Ministry of Industry, Science, Technology and Innovation, Mr. Lahi Chia. Um, lady and gentlemen, uh, thanks for getting into this uh, segment uh, now. So, um, Mr. Dogada, we'll begin with you. How are SMEs in, in, on the continent internationalizing? Um, what is the case for Africa? Thank you. Thank you for, for your joining me at this session. Uh, first of all, I, will say, I would like to say that uh, uh, the inter African trade is the first step, this first. Uh, challenge for African SMEs because uh, only 13 or 15 percent of the exchange for the African countries are inside Africa. So the first market for African SMEs is the overall country uh, inside Africa. Uh, secondly, um, African SMEs are not uh, very connected to the world of business and the world. Um, it's mainly some uh, exploitation uh, or importation of goods, not for transformation, uh, industrialization. So it's one of the, uh, the um, main sector we have to, to, to catch it. And then uh, when I look at some sectors, uh, we, we, we see that for African SMEs, uh, they are right now um, uh, beginning to made some international internationalization for the countries of neighbors uh, to finance, uh, financing sector, um, insurance sectors, agribusiness, transportation, uh, mainly in trade, but also in IT and, 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 and telco. And uh, when I am preparing this, uh, this session, I look uh, forward and uh, look after some key countries uh, for this uh, uh, transformation of SMEs um, from, from Nigeria, from Egypt, uh, from Morocco, from South Africa, from uh, Egypt, from Mauritius, um, Ethiopia, Kenya. Some of them are ready for the SMEs to catch new markets uh, from the abroad, to transform production, to create their own um, special economic zone uh, to attract uh, FDI and to attract finance. But the main gap is how to access to finance, how to access to credit, to loans, how to access to, to equity to develop African SMEs. The second way is how to access to the markets, uh, internal markets, public sectors for the government, because um, sometimes, or maybe always, almost always, the government uh, markets are um, uh, not allowed to be SMEs, local SMEs. It's for international group, large group, or international SMEs. So there is problem to access to their own markets, uh, the public one or the uh, private one. And the over, over mention I, I want to do, is to um, mention of local content. When you got by the FDI uh, intensive investment coming from abroad for the uh, development uh, countries, African SMEs are maybe pretty uh, look for look a place to be involved in the business. So 
there is a lot of investment in mining sectors, in uh, industrial sectors coming from a long way, but not very uh, involved for African SMEs in this business. So they are very um, um, try keep a lot of spend a lot of time to 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 try to be connected. And very two of two of us, maybe I will uh, answer to your question. Uh, there is the um, example of diaspora African. So we have some uh, uh, issue in this uh, in this way. And then for how to make sure the African SMEs will participate with the urban country because uh, of capacity building, because to be able to participate to a large contract, we have to, to be sure that the, the firms, the SMEs, will be uh, in the top to make uh, the, uh, the, the difference uh, and not to, uh, not to be the, uh, the, the last one to inspire and to be uh, profitable for the Zlekaf, the, the African trade zone unique, because there is um, maybe um, a risk that this zone will be open to investors coming from abroad, coming from uh, the developing country, and not to uh, involve African SMEs in the African large markets. So there is a main gap maybe we have to, 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 to explore. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Degui. And um, I will come back to you with a follow-up question on whether the African continental free trade area might perhaps be some opportunities, like uh, Peter Buckley said, uh, towards creating our own value chains in Africa. I, I will get back to you and we can answer that one in a moment. Uh, but let me hear about, you know, what's happening in India. Uh, Ms. Sushma Mortania, um, you know, uh, I know that you are an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, you've also faced your own so, uh, difficulties as well, uh, but also with your work, um, you are you know, connecting and, and putting linkages in associations of over 87,000 MSMEs um, you know, in India. So could you speak to us about how um, this is, is working in India, how SMEs are uh, internationalizing and going beyond their borders? Uh, thank you very much, Yvonne, uh, for this opportunity and privilege given to me to be a part of this August panel. I am present here today in my capacity as member of the Permanent Commission on Social Issues and Women Entrepreneurship for WUSME and as the Director General of India SME Forum. In, it's my pleasure to present the perspective for SMEs um, interna internationalization in India. Asia represents 59.76%, almost 60% of the world's population and is a very vibrant continent. As far as SMEs are concerned, they comprise almost 98% of the enterprises in India and employ about 50% 50 50 of the workforce in India while contributing 30% to India's GDP. India has 63 million MSMEs out of which 99.4 are micro enterprises while 0.52% are small and very minuscule 0.007% are medium enterprises. One significant aspect, SMEs provide the big opportunities for the young people to set up their own businesses and industries. As the most prevailing sentiment amongst the youngsters these days is be your own boss. Don't be an employee, but an employer. And if we have to achieve internationalization of SMEs, the first and foremost focus has to be towards making the SMEs sustainable and competitive and minimize their vulnerability, vulnerability from new market entrants and state of the art products and services that they have to face every day. Internationalization in India started in India many years back and in many ways. MSMEs are aware of the entire export import processes here in India, the uh, type of commodities and products and traditional industries 
um, and the products that work well in international markets. A classic example of sectoral internationalization that took place in India is within the automotive, sec automotive sector. It led to collaboration of technology, increase in technical know-how, the best practices that could be implemented in processes. And uh, it all started when Suzuki started a plant in India their suppliers also followed suit and they wanted to uh, set up their offices in India. They were looking for companies in India to collaborate, which led to a revolution of sorts in the sector. Most SMEs were encouraged to be part of it as vendors and Suzuki actually facilitated uh, to collaborate with vendors from Japan and successful collaborations, joint ventures, technology transfers happened in India. The best of components uh, were exported. And today, India exports the best of two wheelers, scooters, motorcycles, motor cars, and buses. Millions of ancillaries were set up, and they all are now uh, all set and work on cutting edge technology making India a big powerhouse in the automotive sector. Our automotive products are and parts have become integral part of global value chain in automotive sector. Our Indian uh, products and automotive parts have reached maturity levels. They have attained a manufacturing process with prescribed quality standards, and they have been able to create a substantial uh, employment base. So this is uh, one of the uh, case studies and examples uh, in the automotive uh, sector. It has led to also uh, creating a large pool of uh, automotive engineers who are now uh, working internationally. And uh, keeping in view of the global demand, Indian SMEs have also invested in other countries for setting up of manufacturing plants in this particular sector. So this is a classic example of a full scale and a full cycle of internationalization, thereby facilitating innovation, quality, productivity, and employment. You know, keeping this as a precedence, India has many examples in IT sector. Uh, uh, all of you must have heard about Infosys, uh, today, Infosys, uh, it started way back in 1981 with $250, and today it's a $13.56 billion US dollar uh, company with uh, 250,000 employees worldwide. So uh, similarly, transformation has been also uh, seen in pharma sector. India produces and supplies uh, produces 30% of world's requirement of generic drugs. So most of the successful businesses from all these sectors have been from family owned businesses at some point or the other, and they have now become huge uh, corporate houses. There are many examples uh, wherein uh, small uh, and micro and medium enterprises have become multinationals. Lastly, I would also like to add that pandemic uh, has already been instrumental in internationalization of SMEs through pushing the digital enablement and digital transformation of SME businesses. I believe most of us would also agree that e-commerce has proved to be the biggest gift and a learning classroom for many small businesses for whom exports was only a dream. And they had never imagined stepping out of their local and traditional business circles. India has in the last two years seen USD 2 billion worth of uh, exports through e-commerce and it is expected to only grow manifold. So thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for this opportunity. And I would like to add uh, more when uh, Yuan uh, comes back to us with more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sushma. Um, and for really also painting uh, the developmental impact of um, 
the internationalization of SMEs. Uh, I think uh, in Africa, we know all too well just how dependent we were on the COVID vaccines that were being produced in India. And when that halted, when you got, was it your second or your third wave? Um, you know, we felt the impact of that. So, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's, that's very well understood in terms of the jobs that it provides and the impact it has um, on communities and on the economy. Um, so let's hear now the case in Cambodia. Mr. Lahi Chia, who's the director of SME department at the Ministry of Industry, Science, Technology and Information in Cambodia. Mr. Chia, um, what have been some of the challenges uh, that you've seen, but most importantly as well, some of the successes of SMEs um, in terms of uh, internationalizing, you know, getting involved in the global value chains. Thank you, thank you, Renee. Uh, uh, good evening from uh, Cambodia. Uh, I'm very uh, have a great honor to be here uh, to discuss uh, on the second wall investment. Uh, especially, uh, we are discussing on the SME. Uh, I would like to share some uh, related to the uh, SME uh, prospect in Cambodia. We are so we are a small country. Cambodia, we have only 16 million people. And uh, I would like to say that uh, we have, uh, in terms of the SME uh, 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 firm in Cambodia, we have around 520,000 MSME in the whole country. And beside that, uh, we have 70% of 70% uh, uh, is the uh, uh, employment, and 58% uh, uh, contribute to the GDP. And uh, among of that, we have around more than 70% in the food sector. So uh, Cambodia, we divide into two parts uh, in terms of SME sector. Uh, I mean that uh, non-food and food sector. So uh, uh, in terms of uh, internationalization of the uh, SME in Cambodia, uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, Cambodia uh, mostly are uh, micro and small and medium size is uh, like uh, uh, starting the uh, business from the family base. So uh, if we, we're talking about the technology, if we're talking about the uh, 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 skill base, uh, label, so we still uh, seem like a very limited in terms of that. So that's why uh, uh, right now we we have uh, some uh, uh, I can say that like investment or FDI from uh, uh, foreign uh, direct investment from uh, China, from uh, Europe, and from America. Uh, SME in Cambodia uh, mainly. Uh, Cannot, uh, uh, I, I mean that uh, very little of the amount of the SME that uh, are able to export to another country. Uh, more of them uh, uh, supply to the local market and uh, for the medium size only that uh, are able to uh, uh, export to the uh, another country. But uh, if, if you're talking about the figure or the number is very little because of the medium size, a, Medium size is around more than 1,000 of the medium size of SME. I mean, the, the, for manufacturing. So, uh, uh, be, beside the a few of them are able to export to the another country, and the rest so, uh, support to the local industry, like a, a light industry, SEZ, or any the. Uh, uh, like industry in Cambodia. The, uh, this is the, the, the big problem of the uh, SME in Cambodia. And uh, another challenge is, uh, like I also agree with another our speaker, like uh, uh, for access to finance and access to market, access to information and uh, business enabling is also the main challenges of SME in Cambodia. Uh, I would like to say that uh, Cambodia is uh, a growing industry sector is kind of the biggest uh, uh, sector that uh, uh, we are, uh, the government are mainly concentrated on that. And the rice, uh, the sum of product like the rice, uh, uh, textile, footwear, and electronic uh, product is, is uh, the, we can say that uh, the 
the top priority product uh, in Cambodia, uh, the government are mainly focusing on. But unfortunately, uh, come back to the COVID-19, uh, this current situation right now, uh, SME uh, in Cambodia uh, face a lot of challenges. And uh, uh, many of them are confirmed uh, close temporary and uh, 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 more than uh, almost 10,000 of SME confirmed close permanently. This is uh, so sad to hear that. That's why the government uh, released some measurements uh, to support SME, uh, such as that uh, we are just launching the SME bank uh, recently to support SME, and also the uh, tax uh, incentive uh, to attract the foreign investment. Uh, at the same time, we have the uh, National Strategy Development Plan 2018 to 2023. Uh, under the the strategic uh, development plan uh, we have uh, to 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 think that uh, between the uh, skill uh, low skill uh, into the uh, skill based uh, program uh, this is the uh, the policy of the cambodia and uh, we we trying to promote uh, like uh, productivity uh, SME cluster uh, to go to support the SEZ. Uh, this is that the, 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 the thing that I want to share with you. And uh, besides that, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have that mic to share with you here. So I'm waiting to hear from you and uh, look forward to, uh, to, to respond to any question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chia, uh, for that perspective from Cambodia, and it's it's great to hear from you know India, that's uh, you know a larger economy with a bigger population, to the case in Cambodia, and indeed to taking a look at what's happening within uh, the countries on the African continent. I just um, I, I want to wind up the session with with the three of you, but with one last question um, to each of you, even as you give your final uh, thoughts, Mr. Degui, I'll begin with you. Um, even as you close, speak to us about the characteristics of the SMEs that are investing in other developing economies. Um, and we could actually speak about that, you know, within the African continent, the trade that exists between the countries here. Um, any barriers that uh, you feel that would help the SMEs to begin with, to start to conquer the African continent and the region, um, you know, before moving out. And I think, uh, like we said, uh, uh, you know, creating our own value chains here and then um, expanding that abroad. Um, and perhaps you could speak to the possible role that the African Free Continental Trade Area Agreement uh, could play in this respect. Yes, the, this uh, this uh, Zleka, this, um, this zone, is an opportunity for African SMEs. But it's an opportunity if the African creates the ways to communicate for telecommunication from transportation, because it's easier for, for African SMEs to export uh, goods uh, or products or, or natural resources directly to Asia, to Europe. It's mainly difficult to, to, to join the country uh, for the, uh, the, the foreigner right now in the 50, 100 kilometers. So it's a problem of infrastructure to be able to um, use, uh, uh, completely use the, uh, the, the special zone uh, we, uh, and the special trade Zileka um, we, we, uh, we found. And I think uh, in spite of uh, thinking about how to, to open the market largely, African have to make a big effort internally for uh, reinforce the African SMEs for the, uh, the funds. So maybe for the uh, 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 national uh, uh, funds uh, for uh, make some uh, guarantee to SMEs to make them access to, to, to credit uh, and to, 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 to reinforce the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the capacity. And then to make the one-to-one uh, uh, -one contact I think um, with this um, uh, pandemic, uh, the challenge and opportunities is in the digital. Digital to make connection between African SMEs countries, digital to uh, 
sell and, 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 and buy very quick. And um, as um, Sushima said for the African SME, uh, Indian SME forum, um, I'm uh, the special representative of VUSME and the chairman of African SME forum is a large platform of African SMEs connected to the world. Right now is uh, uh, 30,000 enterprise well, for 52 countries. And our goal is to make African very connected to supplier, to equipment supplier, to distributor all over the world, mainly through Africa, I'm telling you, but with the others. So I think there is uh, an opportunity uh, in front of us is how to connect to the world, how to transform our goods transformation, industrial transformation, to be sure that what we need is new markets for our enterprise, is collaboration with the others. So maybe for uh, uh, find new markets, find uh, contracts with subcontracting. I, I, I talk about local content. When you find FD, FDI, you receive a lot of investment in your country. If your, your small enterprise is very strong and very prepared, they can connect to this business to run up. They can share the transfer, um, transfer of technology, as uh, uh, Sushima said, for the India, and to, to make stronger valuation internally. So it's yeah. uh, the, the big, big challenge for Africa is how to be connected to the world and how to, how to involve the world, not only to receive, but to give to the world. Okay, okay, all right, um, thank you. Uh, Sushma, if you, just, you know, in a minute, some of the successes um, or the success factors uh, of FDIs, uh, for FDIs uh, by SMEs, uh, you know, just very quickly as you wrap up and what we can learn from each other, perhaps India and Africa and Cambodia and, you know, a number of the other regions. I believe for any uh, uh, kind of uh, FDI to be uh, successful, there needs to be, uh, you know, uh, more uh, bilateral cooperation forums, and there needs to be um, uh, SME to uh, SME cooperation meetings. Um, uh, you know, in fact, we have facilitated almost uh, 3,000 odd companies for international collaboration through our international SME convention we do every year with the uh, Ministry of MSME uh, each year. And uh, we are uh, very happy to do it on a world platform. Uh, and uh, uh, to make it more successful, um, uh, local uh, regulatory policies of the host country, sensitization of, uh, you know, to the country's policymakers towards making FDI fr uh, friendly policy ecosystem and uh, um, of course, uh, labor policies of host countries. These are uh, some of the factors uh, that play a very, very important role uh, in um, uh, having a good uh, FDI um, SME uh, ecosystem. Ivan? Thank you, uh, Sushma. Um, Mr. Chair, your final thoughts in a minute or less, if you can. Uh, th thank you, Renee. Uh, actually, uh, I I would agree with uh, uh, Susma from India that uh, uh, in terms of the FDI success, uh, we should uh, uh, develop like an ecosystem for the uh, uh, business environment. And uh, for example, uh, between uh, Cambodia, we're talking about the Cambodian case, uh, SME and FDI is a little bit far because uh, of the FDI is looking for uh, another way. Uh, like uh, more different from uh, 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 SME in Cambodia. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, I, I would like to say that, uh, for example, SEZ, SEZ is mostly from Japan, mostly from the American investment, mostly from the uh, another regional uh, uh, investment, and they locate along of the Cambodian border. They not locate uh, 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 mostly in the central of Cambodia. Why? because of uh, the productivity of the SME is still limited, you know? And uh, in terms of the uh, uh, capaci capability to supply to, uh, uh, to, to FDI is still uh, limited. We cannot supply in the, in the uh, mass 
mass uh, production at the same time because of the uh, people, because of the label, because of the raw material, because of uh, some another factor to support the FDI. So from that, we should uh, develop the ecosystem. I mean that uh, all the stakeholders, for example, like the public sector, uh, have their own role to uh, to produce, to develop the, 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 the good policy to support SPI. And the private sector itself they have to be ready to be uh, uh, start uh, good. I mean that uh, uh, for productivity, in terms of productivity, I can say that uh, from Cambodia uh, uh, and another neighbor country in Cambodia, it, it talked about the productivity in terms of the labor skill is very uh, uh, far from each other. So uh, FDI is going to be held uh, uh, consideration whether they come to Cambodia or whether they come to another country. But actually, we have the, a lot of natural resources. That's why. And also, we have a lot of incentive and a lot of quota from the uh, foreign, uh, 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 another uh, uh, big country, we can say like this. So this okay. is from my side. Uh, uh, and I, I have a lot of uh, very little time. So thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chia, uh, Ms. Mortania, and Mr. Dugui uh, for your perspectives on that. Like we said, we're going to take you um, to another part of the world. Uh, so stay with us, but we're moving to um, you know, our second panel um, and uh, taking a look at what's happening in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, my panelists for this section, Ms. Viviana Riverio, who's the Executive Director of the Export and Investment Center of the Dominican Republic, also, from Costa Rica, Mr. Jorge Sequera, who's the Managing Director of the Costa Rican Investment Promotion Agency. And we've got uh, Principal Economist and Inter-American Development Bank, IADB, Christian Volk Martinkas. Um, and at this point, before we even move further and before I invite um, any of the panelists to speak, um, I'd just like all of us um, to join me in congratulating uh, Mr. Jorge Sequera and is Costa Rican Investment Promotion Agency for winning the Global Investment Promotion Award at this World Investment Forum yesterday for promoting investments in health. So a big congratulations to you, Mr. Sequera, and your entire team and your country. Well done uh, for that. We, we, you know, you know, congratulations and the very best uh, to it you. It was completely unexpected. Thank you very much, Ivan. <laughs> very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, well done. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a moment to catch your breath with that. Uh, and I'll begin with uh, Ms. Viviana on uh, the case uh, from the Dominican Republic. Ms. Viviana. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. It depends on your location. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for us as Pro Dominicana, the Center for Promoting Export and also Investment in the Dominican Republic to be here in this open dialogue, uh, in this important forum of world investment. Uh, last year, I was appointed as executive director of Pro Dominicana, but in my career, I have been working a lot with young entrepreneurs, small and medium enterprises. So the topic of, of SMEs for me, it's a very passionate one. And I would like to start with how we are working here in Pro Dominicana, giving access uh, and promoting internationalization in SMEs. In the Dominican Republic, we are conducting a national plan for promoting export and also FDA attraction into any kind of enterprises. But we are particularly prioritizing the specific actions regarding the internationalization of our micro, small, and medium-sized companies, better known as MSEs. In terms of participations in our country, this represents one of the main sectors that contribute to the production and jobs. According to a recent study, SMEs are a part of 40% of the total goods and services that are produced in our territory, which is very important. It is very important also to notice uh, and, and let you know that the Dominican Republic last year were, uh, was able to maintain as a country, not only the position of the uh, first FDI recipient 
in the Caribbean, but also in Central America. And also in terms of our exports, uh, even though that the pandemic hit us hard, we will only decrease 2% overall. And part of that was the ability of and resilient of the exportation sector and also SMEs. Regarding our exports, SMEs export more than 40% of the total worldwide exports and approximately 1.3 million billion per year. In terms of quantity, in our country, this represents 37%. Uh, we have a composition of over 3,000 companies, exports company in the Dominican Republic, and most of them are uh, located in the mining sector, also medical devices, free trade zones, and also our local industries. But the main products exported by SMEs are uh, in Jurli, bananas or plantains, also cocoa beans, and the main destinations uh, specifically for our strategic locations are United States, Haiti, which is uh, at our border, Italy, Belgium, Germany, among others. And one of the things that uh, I think uh, we have to work not only in terms of the Dominican Republic, but also the region, is the ability to change the mindset and, and create a platform that all SMEs can born global. And it's a thing of changing the culture, uh, thinking in the future, and enabling all the digital ecosystems and platforms and policies that must be in place in order to get access to that. In our case, we have been making many changes in the regulatory platform of the Dominican Republic in terms of customs, in terms of tax incentives, and also connecting uh, all the free trade zones and also all international companies with SMEs. I think the key factors for this success in the future is to create a more cooperation and intensive cooperation in the intra-regional trade, also create a culture of innovation and a vision to protect SMEs, especially in this year that I think was Mr. Mr. Peter that was mentioning the vulnerability that we have as a region, as in, in, in our economies, to lose uh, the capabilities of fast response and actions in order to recovery and not to lose those, jo those jobs that are created by SMEs. But also, I think we have to look in the future to create more advantages for small and medium enterprises, such as accessible incentives for companies and also to promote investment in these kind of companies. I think uh, one of the main topics, and especially now that we are talking about the digital economy and all the changes in our territories and legal frameworks, uh, are one of the main issues that are going to rise above in the future. Also, the ability, uh, the availability of qualified personnel and the specialized training centers uh, to grant access to these small and medium companies that cannot, if, cannot afford to have their own training centers. In our, in our country, in most developed areas, we don't have problems with infrastructures or communications, but there are some regions in, in the Dominican Republic that we have to create more infrastructure in order to uh, promote investment and job creations in those areas. And I think that's something that happens in all the regions, in all the countries. Uh -huh. And to create also a special facilities for SMEs that they could benefit from all the incentives, uh, access to capacity building, among others. Okay, um, we will come back to you and talk um, a little bit more about that, but it's very interesting to hear what's happening um, in your country, in the Dominican uh, Republic, pro-Dominicana. 
Um, but what is happening in Costa Rica, Mr. Sequera? Um, talk to us about um, how the SMEs in, in your country are um, entering and taking advantage of the global value chains and what developmental impact that has had uh, back home. Thank you very much, Ivana. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with such distinguished panelists. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the introductory uh, uh, words by, by Professor Buckley, and I, had, and I really related to a lot of what he said, particularly, of course, that SMEs are the backbone of the economy and that in economies like Nigeria, where 96% of the, com of the companies are SMEs, well, it's the same way in Costa Rica. Uh, and I, was, uh, I really liked his term uh, or his words to say, that we need to, that they need to be cherished. And that's what we try to do here uh, in Costa Rica with our SMEs, particularly those that want to be involved, become part of the, of the global value chain. So how do we do that here in Costa Rica? And particularly uh, speaking from a, an investment promotion agency, what is our role in helping that, uh, making that happen? So basically here in our foreign, um, in, for, in our foreign trade sector, we have a triad uh, composed of the Ministry of Foreign Trade, uh, the Export Promotion Agency called Procomer and CINDE, which is the Investment Promotion Agency. So we sort of split it between Procomer and CINDE, how we support this process of internalized, interna internationalization of our SMEs. So uh, our role, particularly at CINDE, is on more on the demand side. So from the beginning, from the start, when a company considers Costa Rica, we put on the table the, the, you know, the large number of potential suppliers both in the manufacturing sector, but a lot in, and growing very fast in the services sector of all types, you know, IT, clean room, et cetera. And so that these companies, when they come to Costa Rica, they see that from the beginning as, as one of our competitive advantages, but that they consider that uh, as part of the plan of coming here to include, you know, those local suppliers as part of their short, medium and long-term plan to establish operations in Costa Rica. We also carry a lot of studies uh, and we work together with Procomer on this and understanding what they are importing uh, so that we can make a plan of how can we uh, substitute some of these imports by uh, supporting SMEs in, in growing their capabilities so that they can you know, become part of these global value chains. And you know, then we work together with Procomer, they work on the supply side and identifying, first of all, which are the potential suppliers for each of those needs. Second, in training, and here in a country, this is uh, you know, quite a challenge because you already mentioned that we're strong, very strong in, in, me in medical devices, for example. We're also very strong in, in advanced manufacturing with companies uh, like Solner and like Intel being here. Well, to become a supplier of any of these companies requires a lot of investment, a lot of perseverance and time, uh, you know, and, 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 a, and a significant investments, like I said, in, in getting all those certifications that are required to become a part of those global value chains. So we help them with that, you know, try to find the financing, the training, the right providers of other services for them to get up to speed uh, to the level that these companies require. But once we achieve that, now they're in, the, in, the, in a position to become exporters. And that's then when Procomer comes in and helps them, you know, internationalize their, their operation and their services. This is particularly, you know, this is happening uh, quite fast and mostly, and, and it's no surprise, in the IT sector, you know, for companies that are supporting here, all kinds of IT uh, needs from the multinational companies are now exporting those services uh, globally, literally, out of Costa Rica, uh, because they have reached those levels of excellence, they have those certifications, uh, and they have those, uh, uh, this, their, those success stories, you know, the companies that can talk about their, their products and services. So this is, this is the way that we hear in Costa Rica try to, to you know, sort of uh, uh, work as a team, understanding the role of each one of our, of our, of our, of our institutions. Uh, and, and again, from the beginning, trying to make that part of any multinational, trying to establish operations here in, in, in Costa Rica. So I'll leave it there because I know we have a short time and I'll be glad to answer uh, questions later. Thank you, Mr. Sakara. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, you know, 
obviously the idea of investment in financing, um, you know, of, of these sectors to enable, um, you know, SMEs, you know, move beyond their borders and to be able to build the capacity that they would require to uh, take advantage of, of global chains in terms of their processes, their product quality to meet standards um, that exist outside their borders, outside their countries. Christian, um, you know, from your position at the Inter-American Development Bank, is this one of the biggest challenges that you see to the internationalization of SMEs? Um, and are there other obstacles? And um, what do you think can be done to help um, SMEs scale up and expand abroad? Thank you very much, Yvonne. And also to, to Anta and all the, the team that organized the session, to, to Claudia, to Amelia, and to Kumi. So it's a pleasure to be here with us, with you today um, on, this, on this panel. Uh, let me, Yvonne, start with, with the putting some numbers in the, in the problem we are discussing. So uh, SMEs have in the region different internationalization strategies and they use these different strategies to a different extent and sometimes following a sequence. So what, which, are, which are these strategies? So they can sell to exporting firms in their countries. They, they can sell to foreign affiliates of multinationals in their countries. What, what that would mean kind of linkages with these firms and participating in global value chains. They, they also can sell directly abroad. They can be exporters. These are sometimes called in report the happy few. And they can establish a own foreign affiliates abroad. And these are the, even the happier few. So, but let's put some numbers of this. And I will take the case of Uruguay, which can be representative for many Latin American and Caribbean countries. In Uruguay, uh, over the last year, you can count 50,000 firms registering sales and purchases. Now, from these 50,000 firms, half of these firms sell to exporting firms. 50% sell to firms that sell abroad. One third, or a smaller fraction of these firms, sold to uh, affiliates of multinational firms. And on average, only 3% of these 50,000 firms sold directly abroad each year. 3%, only 3%. So these are the happy few. And the even happier fewer are those that have an affiliate abroad. And these are only 0.3%. So we started with 50,000 firms, 25,000 firms sell to other firms that export in the country, but only 0.3% have an affiliate abroad. Now, across all these strategies, there seems to be a chain. And to understand that chain, you need a lot of data because you need to see what the firms are doing in the, your country, what they are doing abroad. And, and we do that also for Uruguay. We combine a lot of data. And, and what we find is that there seems to be the, a sequence. There are some domestic firms, SMEs, most of them, that start selling to another firms in Uruguay that are exporting. These firms are more likely to start selling to a foreign affiliate of a multinational firm. So they are likely to start participating in global value chains. And those that start selling to a multinational firm then are more likely to become direct exporters. So, it's a, so you sell to somebody to, who sells something abroad, and then you, at the end of the process, you are yourself exporting abroad. So there is a sequence there. And, and that's something very interesting that, that leads you to think about policies. Uh, and the later stage is the one where firms invest abroad. And, and typically firms, they do it after learning from the market the, where they will settle their affiliates after exporting. And there are a lot of stories behind these aggregate numbers. No? So there are a lot of anonymous stories. And I will mention one, one case from a different country, from Peru, uh, which is a, a, a firm that started as, as a SMEs at the, at the late 70s in, in, the, in the city of Trujillo. And, and they, they produce bodies for motor vehicles and trailers and semi-trailers. This firm, after 20 years, started to export. No? And since then, the number of employees increased by 14 times and their foreign sales by 1,600 times. And they even end up establishing a foreign affiliate in Brazil in 2012. So there is a process. Late 70s, they started. Uh, late 90s, started to export. And, and uh, early 2010s, they have an affiliate abroad. So there, there is a sequence, not all, of, not all firms follow the sequence, especially in this digital world. Many of them, as was pointed out before, they, they born global. 
But there is a sequence. Now, to do that, you need to remove a lot of obstacles. And that's just, I put some titles to your question, and then we can keep the, continue the discussion. So there are a lot of costs. You have lack of information. You have uh, administrative procedures. And then you have, for, to address them, you have trade facilitation policies, trade and investment promotion policies that provide services, in, specialized information services to firms so that they can able to find the markets and to sell their products. And stop here, and then we can continue. Yes, um, and, and, and that's a good place for me to just ask the follow-up question then. What policies are needed by host countries to enable the SMEs in, in their own countries scale up um, you know, this, this chain that you have uh, so elaborately articulated? Um, and you know, what needs to happen both at the private sector and government level in terms of policy and what sort of financing would be required? Yes, so the, um, there are many things. So you, firms, when this internationalization process, they, they face a lot of obstacles. And so, and we, we the, the first thing, which is the context, no? And, and I, I need to mention that. You need a, a stable macro context. You, you cannot operate with high inflation and, 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 and this kind of uh, uh, macro issues. Then you need a, a general friendly business environment. You, you, you need to be able to do business. And of course you need finance access to finance. And you, you of course, need training. And Jorge, Jorge was pointing out in this ex excellent program, which is linkages to export in Costa Rica, which proved to be very effective. So they help firms participate in global value chain through supplying to multinational firms. You need uh, the appropriate infrastructure. So you, if, when you export wood, you need the roads to send the goods to the customs. But then you need the customs to work because you may have the, the best possible highway and, and transport costs are nothing, but then you get to the customer and, and if the shipment is stuck there, then you will lose your customers. So to that, you need trade facilitation policies. You need policies that simplify streamline procedures at the border. And you need to integrate all the actors because when we think about border, we think about the line, but it's kind of a zone, it's a region. There are a lot of agencies with different procedures, different regulations, and you need to, them to coordinate to make the life simple for farms. They need, they need shorter times and they need predictable times. And that's what they need. And then in the end, when you, when you are out of your country, then you need information because assuming that you want to do some business abroad, then you start with this very simple question. Okay, who then should be doing business with? And this is the first question that SMEs ask trade promotion organization. What, who could be my business partner? And even in this digital world where you have lower information barrier, this is still a crucial question. So specialized information services by invest by trade promotion organizations it's a crucial component on a, of any strategy but again that requires coordination between policies because if, if you provide the services and the firm finds the customer abroad then you need to make simple life at home if the customer doesn't help then you you find your your customer but then you cannot deliver in time and you risk losing your business so this is also very important, coordination. There should be a consistent policy framework to help businesses grow and, and expand abroad. And to do that, you need to innovate and you need investment promotion, um, innovation promotion programs that are properly articulated with linkages programs and with this trade and investment promotion programs. So there should be an ecosystem as Jorge was pointing out the, in, in a similar way it works in, in Costa Rica, which is, I think, a very good example. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jorge, you get uh, your final word on this before uh, we move to the next one, um, you know, just in terms of uh, the role of IPAs um, in this process. Yes, no, and assisting course, SMEs, exactly, but, yeah. but It's difficult to add a lot to what the expert in this topic, Mr. Volpe, <laughs> My good friend Christian here just, just said he pretty much covered, but I would add this, um, consistency is fundamental. You need to have this institutional support. SMEs need to know where to go to for that guidance. And you have to have this consistency. You know, this structure that I mentioned, uh, we've had this in place, uh, Yvonne and friends, for uh, over 20 years now. And the results have been that uh, 20 years ago, you know, there was a lot of complaints about multinationals in Costa Rica that they didn't have any linkages, that they weren't supporting SMEs. And, and, and the fact, the numbers today are, at that time it was 7% of all their purchases were 
from Costa Rican SMEs. Well, last year, it was up to 43%, um, and they're, they're linked to 11,000 SMEs. Again, Costa Rica is a small country of 5 million people, so that's a lot of SMEs. And uh, they purchased $2.5 billion worth of goods and services from our SMEs. But this, ha this, this didn't happen overnight. It's been increasingly and steadily growing with a lot of effort, you know, that I've, in four minutes, it was impossible to explain the whole ecosystem, but, you know, it, it, it builds on, on this uh, institutional support to, to guide the, uh, the SMEs through the process. Thank you uh, for that. Ms. Rivero, um, you get the final word. What are some of the obstacles that you see? I know you talked about, um, you know, the successes uh, that you've seen, you know, in your country, pro-Dominicana, um, you know, with, with neighboring countries like Brazil. Um, what are some of the, lastly, final obstacles that you think, um, you know, would need to be surmounted? At the beginning of the, of the first session of this panel, you were mentioning, and also Mr. Buckle, the fact of formality. And I think the pandemic, one of the uh, reflections that must arise is uh, how can we stabilize all that is happening in the region and in the world in order to maintain the stability that the uh, small and medium companies needs. So I think the formality issue is one of the main challenges. We saw that during the pandemic, a lot of uh, formal companies went in the dark side and we are trying to get them back. And we have been very successful regarding that. But I think in general terms, that access to finance, the stability in the macroeconomic and political system is important also. The certainty of the business climate, as Mr. Bolby was mentioning, and also, to increase the, inter the interaction between the private sector and the public sector. In terms of, uh, of the composition of our board, we are a mixed institution. We, we not only work with exportation, but also with investment, but the private sector is present in all the decisions, in the policy making. And we have to, in terms of our region, we have to think in the future, how can we integrate the best practice all the opportunities that uh, all the regions and all the countries have to offer in order to create a strategies and synergies to maintain and to defeat all the obstacles that we have in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for this session. Lots of lessons to learn from you, Viviana Rivero, Jorge Sequera, and Christian Volpe Martinkas. Um, thank you for that. And so um, now moving into the next part of the conversation, which is taking a look at SMEs that are investing in developing countries. Um, and, and that would be an interesting thing to see, um, you know, what's happening in the relationship uh, between um, some of those that are developed and in the emerging economies. Um, for this next session, um, we will hear about um, countries in the developing uh, the developed economies and how they are investing and you know some of the strategies that can be put in place by home countries that are recipients of this investment. Um, let me introduce this panel, Mr. Ahim Hartik, who's a, um, who is an SME um, investment expert, particularly in the automotive sector and then also an IPA expert. Thank you, Mr. Hartik, for uh, joining us. And also the case of the Netherlands, uh, Mr. Edda Offerhaus is the Managing Director of NL International Business, and as well, um, some global perspectives um, from Mr. Martin Casper, who's a specialist on IPAs and, you know, is a regular columnist on the matter. Um, Mr. Hartig, let me begin with you, Managing Director of Germany Trade and Invest, and uh, particularly because you have some experience in, in this regard, working in Ghana and in other countries like Pakistan. Um, speak to us about your encounter um, in your experiences with this and some of the complexities that you have encountered. Well, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak here in this um, in this prestigious event. Just um, for my role, I'm the managing director of Germany Traded and Invest. I'm responsible there for foreign direct investments, for checking foreign direct investments to Germany. And also with my colleagues from the trade department, we are supporting German companies um, to do export. 
And when we're talking about export and outbound foreign direct investments, um, of course, we have to make a we have to make a distinction between uh, the normal, the beaten, uh, the beaten tracks like uh, exporting, for example, from Germany into um, in, into the European Union, which accounts for almost seventy percent of uh, German exports, and um, um, also also to other countries like uh, China, where the export is about seven percent, the United States, where it's nine percent, the UK six percent. So we see um, that. Um, Already by by the by the by the country names that uh, developing countries are not number one, number two, number three on the list. However, they are very important for German small and medium-sized enterprises as targets um, as targets for exports. Um, the whole um, exports of Germany amount to 1.2 billion euros in in 2020, and um, as I just said, it's um, in fact divided um, by the majority to developing economies. But however, I would like to reiterate the, um, the meaning of the Mittelstand of the small and medium sized enterprises in Germany. I would like to reiterate what we had before, um, um, outlining that in Germany we have 3.5 million small and medium sized enterprises, which account for 99%, like in almost every other country, um, above the 90% of, um, um, of all enterprises. So if we are talking about export and if you're talking about outbound FDI, um, it becomes clear that it can almost only be the Mittelstand uh, which does this job. Well, the question is, is that really true or not? And let's, um, let's take a look um, at, some, at some figures from that part. First of all, looking at the outbound foreign direct investments, uh, we can see that um, almost uh, half of them go to so-called emerging, emerging markets. That includes emerging markets in, um, in the Eastern part of Europe, as well as Asia, Africa, um, um, and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, the majority of, um, of German outbound foreign direct investments, in fact, go to a go more to the Asian countries. Um, um, yeah, primarily, primarily to Asian countries. Um, other than Africa, unfortunately, um, which accounts for only less than one percent of um, of German foreign direct investments. However, recently. Uh, recently, we have uh, the um, Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, which is a public bank, has issued a study which shows that um, in a variety and a number, high number of small and medium-sized enterprises is in the process of redefining export and foreign direct investment targets. So we are expecting in the following years that new um, new countries will be will be developed from that part. If you're looking at the industries which um, are, let's say, demanded or which are successful when we look at outbound FDI, it's predominantly manufacturing, which accounts for 30%, which is not a surprise as uh, the manufacturing and production industry in Germany contributes 20 to 23% to the uh, gross domestic product. So it's the largest, uh, it's a very large chunk of, um, of value created by this, by this kind of industry in Germany. So it makes sense to, um, to do also export and cooperation with that. And cooperation with foreign countries is important, not only to conquer new markets, not only to find new clients, but also to build stable relationships between countries. And for that, trade and investment is a very clean and, and very nice uh, and very nice means to do so. This will and is and can be enhanced by um, by institutions, by governmental institutions, for example. Um, the institutions I have uh, um, I have the pleasure to work with. It's Germany Trade and Invest. It's the Trade and Investment Promotion Agency. Obviously, um, for for companies uh, in Germany and abroad, uh, free of charge services are available to facilitate um, to facilitate doing business. And this is every country has it. Uh, almost every country has it. It's a beautiful uh, it's a beautiful thing. Um, if a country can offer this kind of services to give a handshake. To small and medium-sized enterprises, for example, to overcome the hurdles uh, Christian Wolpe um, recently spoke about. So in terms of investment facilitation, it's also a huge job outbound and inbound investment promotion agencies can take. Also, Germany offers, um, um, offers ways through their foreign chambers of commerce abroad, which, uh, which are spread all over the world, to connect foreign businesses with German businesses. Again, here to facilitate uh, cultural contact, to facilitate the understanding of how we could work together and also to, yeah, to achieve an exchange, maybe knowledge um, against market access, against the cultural proximity, and on a long-term perspective, um, finding friends, finding new markets, and um, working together on products and services which contribute to Germany on the one hand and also the guest, the host market um, on the other hand. 
which is important as well if we're talking about frameworks um, is the security of investment also Christian and Jorge talked about that um, that it's a uh, it's a critical success factor for investments Germany um, has more than 125 bilateral investment treaties with other countries that means um, exporting from Germany or doing business with Germany from these with these 125 countries is founded not only on the European Union layer, but also on this layer of, um, of bilateral investment treaties, which gives a, um, a legal security uh, connected with political, st political stability um, in the host country. I would like to, um, to cut it from here um, and then we go, um, go a step further later. Yes, great. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Achim Hartig. And uh, we'll come back and speak about uh, you know, the data on, on SMEs and uh, if that is adequate or sufficient to enable um, you make decisions in terms of where you want to invest, uh, you know, right. in which countries. Um, so we'll come back and talk a little bit about that. Uh, Mr. Offerhouse, um, could we speak about, um, you know, what's happening uh, with the Netherlands uh, with respect to um, the investments that are made uh, by SMEs in your country? Uh, speak to us uh, perhaps uh, more specifically about um, the motivations uh, to invest, uh, you know, in an emerging economy, and um, what sort of measures that you would require in that country that would support um, your SMEs investing there. Please unmute your mic. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Ivan. A good yes, day to you all. You. It's an honor to be here. Uh, it will always also be quite hard. Uh, to contribute uh, to all the, the words that have been said and the interesting visions that have been shared. Um, but I would like to use the opportunity to first uh, elaborate a little bit on the complexity of stimulating SMEs to export, because we face a similar issue in the Netherlands. Uh, we are being introduced as a developed country. I would say the Netherlands is more a trading uh, country. Um, but even in the Netherlands, where um, a large part of the economy is generated by international trade. Uh, in our case, 34% uh, uh, is gener generated by international activities uh, of our economy. Still uh, in the top 10 export uh, countries, eight are in the European Union. Now, that was already uh, shared by Achim as well. Um, uh, but that also might be a point that if we look at international trade, if we look at uh, foreign direct investments, we should not overlook our neighbors. Um, because uh, especially for SMEs, uh, it is more complex to travel around the world. Uh, they feel more comfortable in the neighborhood uh, they grew up in, they do business uh, with, they went to school to. So even in the Netherlands, where 33% of the Dutch GMP is generated by international trade, eight of the top 10 markets are within Europe. Um, another thing uh, that has been shared, if you look at the total uh, number of companies we have in the Netherlands, and you look at the, uh, the corporates, 88%, so uh, more, uh, almost 90% of our uh, large enterprises are active in international markets. And on the SME side, uh, that is only 33%. Uh, so also in the Netherlands, there's still a long way to go to support uh, Dutch SMEs in their international uh, endeavors. Now, what I would like to add, and uh, that might be uh, a new angle of a new insight. If we look at uh, Dutch SMEs, and especially this also counts for the Heinekens and the Unilevers, and they follow a certain path in their international operations. Uh, they start with exporting uh, semi-finished products or finished products and sell them to a local distributor who then starts selling uh, the products into the market. And that will give them confidence that they have the right products at the right price in the right markets using the right distribution channels. Only after that they have proof of concept, they will move probably first into starting with an own sales office still importing, but taking more ownership of the product flow. And what we see is that already has a significant impact on uh, the local market, but these two stages are far less appreciated by the local authorities and regional authorities, and sometimes also the global authorities, because they don't really account for FDIs. 
But SMEs need these two phases to build confidence to start investing in uh, enterprises abroad. Now, if they make that third step, they will move probably into local assembly of products um, and that will uh, add to FDI, but also on a, a limited uh, matter. And they will use this third phase to localize their supply chain. And that is the phase uh, where they interact with local companies and they will swap uh, imported products for locally produced products. And if they have reached the confidence uh, that they can buy the ingredients or the, uh, the, the parts local, then they will move into local manufacturing. And the interesting thing is also in my professional background, the companies, the corporate companies I used to work for, they follow this process. Um, and, and like I said, the Heineken's, uh, Unilever's, they follow this process and SMEs do as well. And then if you look at the support that we give them, uh, then we see that uh, SMEs have a lot of hurdles they face, especially in these first two phases. Uh, and that is about trade finance. Uh, it's not asset finance, it's pure trade finance. How to open a bank account in a new market how to fund uh, the trade flow, uh, how to ensure the trade flow. Uh, the uh, predictable rule of law has been mentioned uh, today uh, about logistics, conflict resolutions, local workforce. And, um, and so the point I would like to add from a Dutch perspective is uh, also in the Netherlands, it is a challenge uh, to stimulate SMEs. We have a lot of uh, programs. Uh, I will not dive into them because they're very similar to the programs that have been mentioned. Um, but we should not overlook the first two phases in entering a new market uh, before they will start investing. And uh, what we try to do, and it's very similar to what Achim uh, mentioned, and which we really appreciate, is the same model where we have uh, bilateral chambers of commerce. Uh, we work with uh, global financial institutions, local financial institutions. Um, but we see most of the public institutions only kick in in the third phase. And I think that is a pity uh, because uh, then we miss uh, the, let's say the, 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 the startup and the scale up phase. Um, that is what I would like to contribute, uh, Yvonne. Uh, Mr. Opperhaus, um, could you speak to us about the host country policies and whether these um, you know, are friendly. When you know we were speaking, uh, you might have mentioned that SMEs are perhaps not well serviced by um, their own governments, and you know, uh, governments in developing countries perhaps more interested in FDI. So, what sort of policy changes would make um, investing SMEs investing in developing economies more attractive? No, yeah, the, 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 um, my my point is basically that also in the host countries, export operations are not properly valued. Uh, so uh, actually from an export perspective, um, uh, it, it is quite reasonable to support companies in exporting finished products to new markets. Uh, but we fully appreciate that the host country at the end of the day uh, would uh, prefer a, a local uh, a supply chain. Um, uh, take the case uh, to, to uh, give it some more content. I used to work for a dairy company and uh, it took us 10 years to build up the confidence uh, uh, in West Africa uh, through export operations. And during these 10 years, uh, we were not heavily supported, nor by the Dutch government, but also not by the governments in West Africa, because they wanted to stimulate foreign direct investments. They said, we will support you the moment you build a factory. And we said, we need 10, 15 years to build the, com the confidence before we can uh, convince our owners to invest in a factory in West Africa. And, and uh, I'm talking about those 10, 15 years. Uh, and we, uh, from my perspective, we need to uh, understand and appreciate that companies need such a period uh, to, uh, like I said, build a confidence, uh, uh, look for local raw materials, local supply chains, get to know the, wor the, the, the workforce. And then the moment you start investing in a local factory, then the policies are more or less okay. But at that moment in time, you hardly need them anymore because you can stand on your own feet. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, you raise a great point there about um, perhaps uh, policies, both you know, of the Dutch government 
and indeed of, of the host um, um, or the recipient governments as well and looking at you know the policy uh, changes there and you know like you said it's important to note that SMEs grow through exports and so that would be something uh, to make sure that um, you know is enabled. Uh, Martin I saw you nodding quite a bit uh, when Mr. Offerhouse was speaking so um, you agree with a lot of his sentiments regarding um, policies and the general um, environment in which uh, SMEs uh, work uh, perhaps uh, particularly in investing in developing countries? Um, yes, uh, so we, we quite a lot of the statements we had in the past, particularly the bits when uh, Edo talked about not being supported. And I think IPAs are incredibly important, but there is a lot of talk about supporting SMEs and a few do that quite well, but the last, vast majority largely ignores SMEs. And if you want to rectify that, I think there are two areas where we need to address. One is policy and the other one is IPA capability. In terms of policies, I mean, it's, it's easy to chastise IPAs, but there is a reason why, and a lot of them ignore SMEs. Um, IPAs need to improve their efficiency and their effectiveness, and they usually do that by focusing the scarce resources they're having on the areas where they think they can have the biggest impact in terms of investment sums attracted to the country or in terms of jobs created. And as long as ministries measure IPAs or the success of their IPAs by the number of jobs created or by the number of in, uh, investment sums being attracted, that's probably a difficult one because in that pure sense, if you measure it by that sense, SMEs are probably a bad deal. There's a lot of work, there's a lot of hassle, and then you have five or 10 jobs. And I think that's a tricky, that's a dangerous way of looking at it. And that is why we potentially should sort of try to adjust the, the way how we measure success. Um, and there, there are two reasons why I would, would argue that. One is the very reason for the existence of an IPA in economic theory and academic discourse is that they're supposed to help alleviate information asymmetries, that they're supposed to help, I don't know, market failures. And in, in economic theory, interfering in the free play of the market, spending taxpayers' money on, on things like IPAs, is only okay if you address a market failure. But surely, if there is such a thing as a market failure on account of information asymmetry, it's the SMEs who face that the hardest. So if IPAs focus on large projects and large corporations, are they then still in the process of addressing market failure or aren't they actually doing the opposite? Which I know, still is totally rational, driven by the metrics they're measured on. But I think this is probably not the most valuable way how we can organize that. And the second thing, and that's probably even more important, um, despite the fact that SMEs are a lot of work, I think, they are incredibly good in a business sense. They make a lot of business sense today and particularly in the future. The large multinationals are out there already. They have a global footprint. And if anything, the large multinationals are probably shortening their supply chains at the moment. So if you want to have a stream of new investment coming into your country, you probably need to focus on those who will be investing in the future because they need to be close to their customers. And that is small and medium sized, sized enterprises. But if IPAs are ready or want to be ready for these companies, I think they need to adjust their game because the needs of the large multinationals and the needs of the SMEs are totally different. Um, and that sort of brings me to, to capabilities. Large Corporations know exactly what they're doing. They, they have dedicated departments. They, they are well honed in, in operating that, that system. And sort of their contact to IPAs very often is in terms of optimizing the results through fiscal and financial incentives. While SMEs, and that sort of came out very nicely in, in the talks of Edo and particularly also in, in terms of Christian, is that they have operational difficulties. They don't know what on earth is going on, particularly those with the first or second FDI project. Um, they're really concerned about costs. I mean, how, how much does it cost to employ a, a worker? How much does it cost to, to rent a facility? They're really keen, and that is sort of the, the sense Ada talked about, 
to establish the trust to a country. They're really keen on getting up their operations as quickly as possible. So they worry about tax registrations, about setting up legal entities, about getting an electricity hookup. All those questions you worry about in setting up a new company. And I think that is one of the key questions IPAs need to decide on. How deeply do they really want to get involved in getting production permits, in dealing with you know, customs regulations, things like that? Because that is what the managers of SMEs are really concerned about. That is what keeps them up at night. And if they want to talk to somebody, this is the topic they want to discuss, which is entirely different than what many IPAs are doing at the moment. And as said, light and shadow, there are some really, really good IPAs doing that very proficiently. I think a lot of developing country IPAs um, have some potential to develop in, in, in that respect. And I know the point is, IPs are a lot of work. You don't get a lot of jobs out of that. Don't stick too strongly on the metrics of what you want to achieve. Because I think in the long term, if you want to have FDI flows, these are the companies you need to, uh, to focus on. Uh, yeah, and you raise uh, such an interesting point um, there. So, well, IPAs would then be asking, what would be the measures of success that they should be looking at when it comes to the sort of support that they're giving SMEs um, in that respect? And, and, and also sort of a, a two-pronged question. Um, let's also focus on the SMEs uh, now. What sort of strategic reorientation do they need beyond capacity building, which is a term we hear a lot? Mm. I think we're living in interesting times and, and uh, capacity building is one of the key topics we, we, we need to concern, we to be concerned about. Um, it is to deal with operational problems. And I, I totally recognize the fact that there is a difficulty for IPAs in as much as the question of crowding out the private market. Um, and I think you can develop a model in working with the private market to, to, to deal with that. The bigger issue for IPAs though is they don't tend to have a pipeline to these small companies. I mean, I wrote my PhD on, on IPAs, and, and one of the most interesting findings was that the vast majority of IPAs have no idea what IPAs are and what their service levels are. So those companies who would benefit the most from an IPA actually don't reach out to them, don't know that they exist. And I think that is one of the big, the big difficulties. And the last bit, and again, mirroring very much what Jorge said, what, what Christian said, what Ido said, what Achim said, SMEs are not very versatile. They're not very experienced in dealing with that situation. So it needs to be as easy as possible for them to operate in that world. And it is the parameters, the, you know, the ease of getting goods in and out of the country to get capital in and out of the country, the regulatory framework, because the more we get to automation, the less you know, low labor cost considerations are, are of importance. And I think in the long term, that might be one of the bigger dangers for developing countries. Um, okay, great. And, and thanks for raising that issue about you know, IPAs and, and, and better understanding of their role and you know, how to assist SMEs. Um, Ahim, I have the final question to you. Um, you know, Data on SMEs, um, how available is that? And is that one of the barriers uh, you think um, for investing in, in developing countries? And how can we um, you know, uh, surmount that challenge? Yeah, I think it's a chicken egg thing a little bit, um, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, once there are hardly foreign direct investments, outbound investments, especially in developing countries, so we hardly have data about that. But, uh, um, this is also this is also a job um, a job partly for 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 the industry um, to to a certain degree. Um, many of the products and services we produce in Germany these are high priced, uh, high quality products which last uh, let's say 20, 25 years, thirty years without any problems. And um, if we look for a for a product market fit, especially in developing countries, um, it's worth a thought um, that maybe products at a high price don't match really the requirements at a certain stage where a market is in the beginning of developing itself. So um, if there would be a recommendation, apart from the data we, <laughs> we would like to have is also, and um, is also 
those companies who where it fits the strategic plan they might think about line extensions of their products and services which uh, which give different qualities and different configurations not less quality but uh, but maybe different configurations which make their products and services more affordable hence having a larger footprint in developing markets and i'm speaking of the european union perspective uh, where other regions of the world um, they already understood this uh, that this is the way to conquer a market and they do it successfully and so i think this is also an encouragement for um, for industries and in, in our regions to to think if it could be an option to do this but data um, data in the end um, is is available in germany yes it's about it's available um, about small and medium-sized enterprises also on the european union basis but it it can be more differentiated and um, and um, uh, persons like Martin, he does a lot of research um, and, and, and did a lot of research also in his PhD, contributes to a very significant part of this data situation is enhanced there. And also multinational um, um, like the, um, corporate operations like the Youngchart or the OECD, they're gathering data about small and medium-sized enterprises and outbound, and outbound FDI. But there's still a lot to be done, but I want to point it, point it out this chicken and egg problem that we also need activities um, and uh, encourage guided by the right framework of the governments for companies uh, to do business abroad. Great. And, and so what would be your uh, final words about um, what sort of policies you'd like to see both in, uh, you know, the country, the developing economies, and of course, of, um, of the developed as well? Um, what sort of policies would work mm. on both ends that would enable this uh, relationship be more efficient? In terms of assisting SMEs in developing in developed countries um, to invest in emerging economies. Okay. To my experience, and uh, in my previous life, I did a lot of export finance for international banks. It's uh, the stability of the systems uh, involved, which which is, gives the foundation. All the rest is um, is a play of a free market, a free and open market, with level playing field of the actors. So if there's a play of the market, and the product market fit is attractive for both. Then the companies will suit uh, will suit the needs of the buyers. However, there should be catalysts like investment promotion agencies, and like Martin said, um, there can be a lot of services developed in investment promotion agencies to facilitate this information gap, which might be there um, to to address to address information needs on the buyer side and also on the supplier side, so that foreign direct investments can be made easier. But what kind of policies? free and open markets, a level playing field for all the actors. That's a very good start and we don't have it everywhere in the world. This would be something really nice to achieve. Mm. Martin, your final um, thoughts? Well, yeah, se se second the point of Achim, uh, level playing field, really important. Um, it's a high wish in many countries. Um, so in that respect, we probably still a long way off. And in that, I think IPAs, Investment promotion agencies and trade promotion agencies play an absolutely crucial role to sort of bridge that barrier. If situations aren't perfect, they are the ones who really allow you to operate in, the, in, that, in that world. And sort of if, if a closer link to SMEs could be made, I think we are there. They're, they're in a crucial position. Uh, Mr. Offerhaus, your closing remarks? Yeah, we do a lot of research among SMEs. And every time we ask them, what do you need from us? And basically, they all always say the same. And that is insights in opportunities and context. And uh, those are the, the elements I think the people around this table uh, contribute to. Uh, where are the opportunities? And, and uh, what is the size of the opportunity? What's the size of the price? And with whom can I partner? Uh, and all the other uh, elements are means to an end. Um, and, and in general, SME entrepreneurs are very well capable of managing themselves. But if we can support them in showing the opportunity in developing countries and support them in getting in contact with the right people, I think we can do a tremendous job. Thank you uh, for that, Mr. Edo Oprahaus, uh, Mr. Martin Kasper, and Mr. Achim Hartig. Um, thanks for your uh, views and insights on this. And, and you've just laid a perfect segue into where we're going. And just a reminder of um, you know, what was said at the start of this uh, session um, in the opening remarks by uh, Ms. Durant, who's the Deputy Secretary General at UNCTAD, just reminding us all that everything that we have discussed here 
um, and uh, you know we'll go into more research. And I know we we started off very well with uh, Dr. Buckley from the University of Leeds on the knowledge that we have on SMEs and their internationalization, um, and uh, you know where we're going. Um, you know, with this one. Uh, but just a reminder to everybody from what Ms. Duran said is that, you know, there's a new research project on SMEs and FDIs, and that is the next session that we are going into. And a lot of this will form the basis uh, for that new project and that new research that is being undertaken. And so that next session that we're going to is an academic roundtable with some policy makers uh, on how to leverage the developmental impact of um, the internationalization of SMEs. So I would like to thank each and every one of my panelists for this session, what we're calling part one of this conversation. You have been very helpful for making the time, for preparing your thoughts um, and sharing those with us from you know, the various parts of the world. Thank you all very much uh, for contributing to the body of work and the knowledge uh, that is very crucial in this sector. I would now like to hand it over to Ms. Claudia Trentini from UNCTAD for the next session.